Good evening, everyone. My name is Annette Li Now. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us for the Southeast Asia Lecture Series, sponsored by the Asia Center of Harvard University. Um, it is my great pleasure to be um, welcoming our speakers today, uh, two formidable scholars whose work extends to work extends to the afterlives of the controversial anti-communist violence that took place in Indonesia in 1965-1966, Dr. Grace Luxana and Dr. Ulan Virgantoro. Um, I'd like to let everyone know that we will be recording their, uh, their opening remarks um, this, this evening, um, if you are joining us on the East Coast. Um, and uh, so for, for the time being, if you would prefer not to have um, your, uh, your image is recorded or your name's recorded, uh, please note that, uh, that, that a recording is, is uh, taking place. Um, Dr. Grace Luxana is currently a lecturer at Malang State University in Indonesia, having received her doctoral degree from Leiden University and served as a research affiliate at the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. Her research engages broadly with questions of collective memory, oral history, and anti-communist persecution, topics on which she will, of course, be presenting today, in addition to histories of decolonization and rural politics in Indonesia. Her forthcoming manuscript, entitled Embedded Remembering Memory Culture of 1965, Violence in Rural East Java, will be published with Amsterdam University Press. She is currently also working on a new project on histories of citizenship with a focus on ex-colonial plantation societies in the southern part of East Java. Her talk on remembering anti-communist violence in Indonesia today draws our attention to sites of historic violence in East Java to consider the ways in which their meanings have appeared to transform and to be negotiated by local communities over time. Uh, her talk will be followed by Dr. Dirgan Toro's presentation on historical violence and strategies of representation in Indonesian visual arts after 1965. She joins us from the University of Melbourne, where she is currently a lecturer in art history and curatorship at the School of Culture and Communication. Her broader research interests include gender, feminism, trauma and memory, in Southeast Asian modern and contemporary art, focusing especially on Indonesian and Timor-Leste contexts. Her publications include a monograph entitled Feminisms and Indonesian Contemporary Art, Defining Experiences, published in Amsterdam University Press in 2017, um, in addition to an essay among uh, many on the aesthetics of silence, Exploring Trauma in Indonesian Painting, 1970 to 1980, published in an edited volume uh, which appeared through the National Gallery of Singapore's ambitious alignment, New Histories of Southeast Asian Art. Um, with that, um, I'll mention as well that Dr. Dirgantura's talk will engage with questions of aesthetic practice and transcultural memory in the work of several contemporary Indonesian artists and consider diasporic transgenerational and transgenerational perspectives on the impact and representation of historical violence after 1965. And her, her presentation will encompass works by uh, Tintin Mulia, Yaya Sum, and Dadang Cristanto, and Ranga Purbaya. So each talk will be around 20 minutes, after which time we will open the floor to questions for the remainder of the hour. Um, at that point, should you have, have questions or comments, please raise a virtual hand or use the chat function to indicate um, that you would like to um, engage with the speakers. Without further ado, please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Lixana and Dr. Tirgantoro. Thank you very much. Grace, thank you very much if you'd like to begin. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Annette, for the very warm introduction and welcome. Um, thank you also to Jorge, who have, uh, both of you have organized this seminar, uh, despite the horrible time differences between the three of us. Um, and good morning to everyone uh, who uh, is here, and also to Mbak Wulandir Kantoro. So um, <clears throat> let me just start my share screen. 
Okay, so um, today I will uh, talk about how uh, sites and narratives and their coexistence uh, of 1965 violence uh, are uh, play a major role in uh, remembering the violence itself. So <clears throat> to begin with, uh, probably most of you also have known uh, about how these, uh, about how different narratives um, always emerge when uh, Indonesians uh, and others talk about 1965 in Indonesia. So there's this, uh, on the one side, there's this formal national narrative about the killings of seven generals and the accused uh, Communist Party as uh, the mastermind behind this attempted coup. Uh, while on the other hand, there's this uh, following um, anti-communist persecutions against the left and uh, the communists in Indonesia uh, that happened throughout 1965 and 1966, uh, which remain largely excluded in the national historiography. They are not recorded in textbooks or um, any uh, formal historical records. So, <clears throat> uh, but then uh, when I, uh, started my research, I um, I realized that today uh, the context is very different with uh, the New Order era. Uh, so where both narratives are not actually negating each other, uh, not unlike the authoritarian New Order, where the formal narratives is very dominant, um, people are scared, they uh, tend to uh, silence themselves about talking about the violence. But uh, today, both narratives actually coexist and they became entangled. And uh, so I also realized that authoritarianism, repression, and the state memory projects uh, do not automatically uh, erase these memories of violence. And uh, so it shows that uh, these memories are not merely a resort of uh, state construction <laughs> with um, their uh, memory projects. But instead, these memories are very contextual and embedded in social relations. So I decided to zoom into locality to see how these memories continue to persist in the present. Um, <clears throat> and the approach that I use is, um, well, first is uh, Pierre Nora's Liu, the memoir, or the sites of memory, where uh, he argues that memory is actually crystallized in, for example, places, sites, objects, um, and it shows the continuity of the past in the present. Uh, but I would also like to put forward the question of who actually has the intent to remember uh, who created the sites of memory and why and uh, what for. Um, and this question shows a kind of the power relationship in uh, creating and remembering uh, certain events. Uh, I also see this uh, sites of memory uh, in a broader uh, concept of memory landscapes where different sites are connected and continuously reshape the memory itself. Uh, and this concept also relate to another concept which is about the agency of sites where uh, it's not uh, only the people who create the sites, but the sites itself also influence the surrounding individuals or groups in and beyond the national and international framework of heritage. So <clears throat> to give a, 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 detail, a more detailed description of the research areas, uh, this is my research area on East Java, but on the south southern side. <clears throat> and if um, this is not a very good uh, visual <laughs> uh, depiction, but uh, when uh, we zoom into the district, uh, we can see how uh, the sites of violence are actually scattered within um, the uh, point where people uh, actually spend most of the, the time in their village activities. So the numbers on the map uh, indicated uh, places uh, where people spent most of their time, uh, the market, for example, the village office, the police office, the field and the church, 
while the dots uh, represent uh, the sites of violence that are related to 1965. Um, so I would like to go to few uh, to a few of, of the sites uh, that are there in the district of Donomulio. And this is the first one, <clears throat> and which uh, is very much uh, characterize the area. So everybody knows this monument and when uh, this is also uh, the character of the district and it is uh, placed in the center of uh, intersections of roads, which connects uh, the village with uh, other villages. And uh, as you can see, there's this statue above uh, depicting two people, uh, an army officer, uh, wearing full clothes and also the civilian uh, carrying the sharp uh, bamboo, which is a legendary weapon since the revolution, since the Indonesian revolution. And under the statue is uh, a relief uh, of uh, many uh, messages. Um, for example, <clears throat> uh, the one on the right is all about village life, but uh, it's not about the ordinary village life, but actually uh, it conveys a message what a village life should be, uh, how the women should behave, how the men should be uh, regarded as intellectuals by reading books. And also there's a symbol of a mosque, uh, which represents Islam. Uh, and this, uh, all of these are actually built to uh, represent how the state wanted village people to behave. And if we, there's also an inscription under the statue, uh, which is written in a very high level of Japanese. Uh, the first sentence, Angestiraras uh, Trus Manungal, is actually written in a form of Chandra Sankala, which is a form of writing year that does not use numbers, but words. And a good Chandra Sankala is not only a combination of words, but the entire sentence uh, forms a profound meaning, uh, conveying philosophical messages to its readers. <clears throat> and this uh, and this sentence, Angestiraras Trus Manungal, refers to the year 1968, uh, the year when when the monument was built after uh, uh, after the Trisula operation, uh, which targeted the remaining uh, PKI uh, activists who are hiding in uh, this area. Uh, but it also conveys the message of focusing on harmony to achieve unity. So that is the philosoph philosophical message of uh, the sentence. Oh, the unity here uh, is described uh, is described by the second sentence, which uh, says that uh, the unity of Abri, which is uh, the army, with the people is a form of national defense. So <clears throat> uh, if we compare it to the national monument in Jakarta, it has a very uh, similar tone where the statue are uh, on top and then uh, relief uh, are at the bottom, uh, depicting uh, all of the events uh, surrounding the uh, gay 30 s so the moment of the coup. Uh, but then what is interesting for me is when I talk to people, uh, asking them about what the monument is about, and this is when different narratives started to emerge about the event itself. So for example, on uh, the left, we see a statement from the villager that uh, actually reproduces the official narrative uh, that is gonna fade through the monument, uh, saying that um, with the, uh, without the help of the people, uh, the military operation of eliminating PKI would not be a success and that the uh, monument expressed the synergy between the army and the people. While uh, another villager uh, didn't actually mention explicitly about this official narrative, but for him, it was about the 
uh, tension uh, because of the killings. So uh, when I asked him, all that he explained was about the killings that happened throughout uh, 1968. Bodies were scattered um, uh, and nobody knows who did it. And uh, those who died were considered as a PKI, although it had not yet been proven. So although the Trisula monument aims to convey the official narrative, its present state <clears throat> resembles a completely different one. And this uh, reflects the aspect of non-determinism of uh, heritage. So how monuments are used and, in, on, and interpreted today do not really resemble the past or the period when it was established. So this history and image of the new order's modernity, development and security is far removed from what villagers remember, while the violence itself lingers more deeply in the villagers' memories. So um, I would like to go to another monument that was also erected by uh, the official uh, uh, government in the area, which is called the Bayangkara Memorial Complex, or um, the Ngrendeng uh, monument. Uh, with this monument actually commemorates uh, four uh, police officers who died in uh, the 1948 uh, Madiun affair. And this Madiun affair uh, in formal historiography, it is uh, recorded as uh, the event or <clears throat> uh, as the event where the PKI uh, launch is a revolt against uh, the Indonesian uh, state. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the monument, this monument was built in 1971. So why does it take so long uh, to build a monument that aims to commemorate 1945, 1948 Madian affair? So it turns out that in 1971 was the year where the first national election of the new order took place. And this election used the army's systematic uh, structure, their domination in villages and collaboration with local bureaucracies, which resulted in um, the winning of Suharto's uh, ruling party. So the Ngrindeng monument is part of a national project to convey dominant features of the new order, which is security, development, uh, and anti-communism in the new order. So Madiun, um, the event that the monument uh, aims to commemorate, became the event in the past that was needed to maintain the portrayal of the treacherous communists. And the monument became uh, the new order symbol of uh, security. Um, it's, the monument also shows that instead of commemorating the past, the site of memory was created to fulfill the needs of the present or the new order itself. What is also interesting is about the caretaker of this monument or what we Indonesians call uh, Juru Kunci. <clears throat> so he said that the monument used to be a center of commemoration during the National Heroes Day, uh, usually attended by police officers, village operators, and school children. Uh, but it's, it all ceased around 2010, and since then the monument uh, just uh, nobody visits, uh, visits it uh, anymore. Um, and it is also interesting when later I found out that the caretaker was actually uh, a collaborator. He assisted the military operation in 1965. He was then appointed as the caretaker uh, because of what he did uh, as, uh, uh, to assist the army. And he was given a very small salary from the village government budget since the monument was established. But as the monument loses its significance, so does the caretaker, uh, including his relationship with the authority, as he stated to me that uh, he, uh, he thinks that the police should consider him as the guardian of the monument and uh, they should consider him as one of his subordinate. Uh, and he wants to be always close to the police um, officer. And uh, he was also disappointed that the police never came down to him and um, 
see what's going on with the monument and also with his life. So uh, in here, we can see how the sites of memory uh, also play a role in maintaining clientelistic relation between the authorities and civilian uh, who are uh, related, who took part uh, in uh, the violence in 1965. Um, <clears throat> And the last uh, site is actually the mass graves. Uh, there are two mass graves that I uh, uh, found uh, in uh, Donomulio in the district. Uh, one is a public cemetery, which also uh, functions as a mass killing site uh, during the 1965 operation. Uh, so the detainees were brought in groups to the cemetery and uh, were killed uh, in this area. Uh, and another mass grave is a more um, isolated place, uh, which is called the, in the area of uh, Mulio Sari. And um, I met the person, uh, which is the son of a leftist activist of Mudarakyat, so a youth organization that was affiliated with PKI. And he saw, uh, the last time he saw his father was uh, when his father was detained and he was a very small kid at the time. Um, but after in, in his late uh, 20s, he decided to uh, search for his father's grave. So he took a spiritual journey uh, and also asking surrounding uh, residents uh, if they know what happened and from information of the villagers, they pointed to this particular uh, area. Uh, the grave had no tombstones at the time, uh, no marks, uh, nothing. Uh, but then because of spiritual guidance, uh, his ghostly experience, he was convinced that his father was spirit there. Uh, but what is also interesting that the grave uh, was also known by other villagers who came to find spiritual hints about their major life decisions, such as choosing a spouse, getting married, or even uh, choosing lottery tickets. So <clears throat> uh, this is, I think, uh, the experience of mass graves actually pointed to uh, what uh, a phenomenon, uh, a particular phenomenon in Indonesia, which is uh, known as the potent death. So the power that the death exert over the living in contemporary Indonesia. But what is interesting that in this case, uh, it was the communist uh, or the so-called outcast uh, that uh, uh, made them into the potent death. So we see how the private experience of a family, uh, the father who was detained and killed in 1965, uh, transformed into a public spiritual site. Um, and this also pointed to Avery Gordon's um, uh, research about haunting experiences, where she said that it's not merely about uh, the dead or the missing person, but uh, they became a social figure that reflects the connectivity of history and subjectivity. So haunting became a notification of what's been suppressed or concealed, uh, which is very much alive and present, interfering with us, but also with the system of repression that produce uh, the silence and the trauma. So um, to sum up, what can we say about these memory landscapes of violence? I think that rather than single narratives, this memory landscapes show complex entanglement of the public and private, the past and present, or the silence and shared knowledge. And despite the initial intention during the creation of these sites, their meaning transform over, over time. And as the state who developed the monuments diminished, the intended commemorative functions of these monuments also became very uh, less, very much less uh, important. Um, and what I also find interesting is that how these sites are always in a dialogical process with the surrounding people. And at some point, these sites also uh, functions as um, device of negotiating uh, uh, the present society 
rather rather than uh, symbols of the past. So I think I will just uh, leave it there and um, thank you. And I will return it to Annette. Thank you so much, Grace, for this illuminating first presentation. With that, I'll invite Ulan uh, to, to present her talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank okay. You. All right. So um, thank you, um, Annette and Jorge, for the invitation to speak this morning or this evening. Um, uh, so selamat pagi, um, good morning for, uh, from Nam or Melbourne. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respect to their traditional, um, to the own, um, to the elders past and present, and extend that respect to other First Nations people in the audience. So uh, my talk today will reflect on the issues surrounding the representation of historical violence in the practices of visual artists such as Dedang Cristanto, Tintin Wulia, Ranga Purbaya, and Yaya Sung. The term after 1965 describes the impact of historical trauma on aesthetic practices in Indonesia. So I will not repeat some of the um, background historical information that Grace has already um, mentioned um, in her presentation. Um, so instead, I will um, really look at how um, 1965 um, in, indeed have a long lasting impact on uh, memory practice and also um, aesthetic practice in Indonesia. Um, okay, all right. So clearly the mass killings caused a reorientation of Indonesian society, uh, whereby the art state in Indonesia's new order radically shifted with the left-leaning artists and intellectuals disappeared, imprisoned or exiled during the anti-communist purge, the artists who survived turned away from any socio-political subject matter that could be linked to leftist ideology. So from 1966 to 1998, public discussions of the killings um, was forbidden. Um, state agencies actively intervened to censor any mention in public documents, including visual displays, artistic representations, or allusions to the killings. Uh, and so accordingly, the mass killings were absent from public discourse for the 32 years of the regime. Indonesians had to pretend that the massacre did not happen, uh, although millions affected were family members, neighbors, uh, and business partners. Uh, they were the victims, witnesses, collaborators, and perpetrators. So the absence was also reflected um, in the visual art scene by the lack of direct references about the violence in the artworks and art historical writing um, under the new order. Um, Broadly speaking, uh, for many contemporary Indonesian artists whose works engage with contemporary political issues such as environmental destruction, gender critique, and human rights abuses, a testimony often lies at the heart of the artist's message. Now, testimony through art becomes essential, indeed vital, to fill the gaps where truth and its supporting legal evidence are often called into question. It is also significant because in the face of campaigns by the state and mass organizations against remembrance and reconciliations for the mass killing survivors, Indonesian visual artists and activists' visual strategies become crucial. Um, however, given the weight and emphasis placed on one artistic trope to represent a complex historical event whose effects are still being felt across time and generations, some questions remain unresolved. What is made visible? What is concealed? And what is obscured by specific kinds of artistic production? Furthermore, how and in what ways do these artistic works continue to unravel some of our assumptions about the role of 65 and 66 in the present? So to answer some of these questions, we need to reposition the role of testimony in Indonesian contemporary art and its reception. 
So of the relatively few visual materials from the immediate aftermath of the 30th of September event, most were produced and circulated by the perpetrators for propaganda or military documentation purposes. Uh, so as um, Grace's presentation showed us the various monuments and as well as uh, the various military museums um, supported this idea. So the propaganda and subsequent, uh, subsequent Type military and state control over the visual material concerning one of the worst atrocities in Indonesia's modern history explain why most Indonesian artists place oral history and testimonies at the heart of their works. So um, Astrid Earle's notion of traveling memory, that is um, all cultural memory must travel, be kept in motion in order to stay alive, to have an impact both on individual minds and social formations can be considered to look at how oral history is utilized in the context of 65 and 66. Um, relatedly, Wolf uh, Kansteiner mentions that the necessity is to scrutinize the memory makers and consumers interests and needs in the memory field. Now such functionalist perspective is necessary to understand the importance attached to specific memories. For what purposes are memories used? What kind of needs and whose needs can be made by the mediation of certain stories and interpretations of the past? Furthermore, it is important to study the reception of these memories to identify who are the memory agents. It makes a difference whether they possess cultural capital in terms of authority and trust in the memory's consumer's eyes. It makes a difference too, whether the memory agents manage to identify the audience needs and interests and shape their narratives accordingly. So in this context, visual artists becomes carriers of memory and or memory maker who share in collective images and narratives of the past, who practice mnemonic rituals, display an inherited habitus and can draw on various repertoires of explicit and implicit knowledge. They do so in various ways, including reimagining the events based on ethnographic research, creating counter memorial works or digging deep into their personal and collective memories. For example, inspired by a story about a roving photographer in his hometown who took photographs of alleged communists before they were interrogated, the Dan Cristanto adopted the story and developed it into several works, um, such as here, uh, the series uh, Missing, um, exhibited at Whaling Gallery in Kuala Lumpur. So the act of referring to factual reality through testimony allows Indonesian visual artists such as Dadang to act as historians, but still leaves room for the imaginative evocation of 65-66 in ways unavailable to the historians. For Cristanto, the portraits represented in missing series represented an imaginary visual archive, not of known individuals, but of unrecorded anonymous victims and survivors. The artist's familiarity with and use of photojournalistic strategy reveals his ongoing search to make sense of the violence that claimed his father when he was only seven years old. However, as an aesthetic category, testimony is also comprised of bits and pieces of memory that has been overwhelmed by occurrences that have not settled into understanding or remembrance, or events that are in excess of our frames of reference. Given that testimony cannot provide a total understanding of the past, the enterprise of truth-telling through works of art seems an impossible task. Tintin Wulia an Indonesian artist currently based in the UK. Um, so Wulia's grandfather was taken away in 65. He was never found and must be presumed dead. Wulia never met her grandfather. She only knew about him and his story from um, family conversations and photographs. So as a visual artist, uh, Wulia began her project in critical geopolitics in 2005. In 2005, she interviewed Sobron Aidit, an Indonesian ex exiled writer living in Paris. Uh, so Aidit was one of the thousands of Indonesian leftists trapped overseas in the aftermath of 65-66. Aidit and his family lived in China for 17 years before finding refuge in France in 81. During their time in China, they all had to adopt Chinese names and stop speaking Indonesian. 
So Wulia reflected that Aidit's exilic narratives had influenced her conceptual engagement with the multiple memories of 65. The Indonesian political exile's narrative of knowing Indonesia from afar resonated with her sense of internal displacement from racial discrimination as Chinese Indonesian ethnic minority and from keeping her grandfather's disappearance in 65 secret from the public. So the materials gathered from her interviews drove Julia to create several distinct projects. Untold Movements Act One is a large scale installation comprised of 32 channel audio installations that were played synchronously. The speakers were sewn into the black fabric that hung from the ceiling to the floor. The artist also added a blinking motion sensor to each fabric base. The blinking lights followed the sound projected from different parts of the room, adding to the spatial confusion within the gallery space. There were poems, testimonials, and snippets of conversation from five different languages, English, Indonesian, Arabic, Chinese, and Vietnamese, read by the artist's friends and family, many of whom are refugees and second generation migrants. The narrations were partially based on true stories that the artist collected during the research of this work. So the text, um, or rather the speech, the poems, spoke of travel, hope, loss, and longing. The installation was a sonic embodiment of the conflicting narratives of memory and belonging from migrants and exile communities. Within the installation, the artist allowed each national language and physical borders to cross and amalgamate, producing a flow of multiple narratives in a single space. The installation sought to represent the heightened sense of fear and displacement experienced by refugees across the world. While it does not specifically mention 65, at the heart of the installation is the refugee sense of loss and displacement some of which caused by genocidal violence and explosion that echoes Aidit's life story. In subtext after Kawara's title, 1965, Wulia elucidated the impact of US territorial actions and the interconnectedness of diverse simultaneous world events. She looks at 65 as a thing in common where, as she stated, an artwork acts as a meeting point that triggers connection between different agents. During an artist residency at the Smithsonian Institute in 2019, Wulia came across Onkawara's painting. Onkawara is a Japanese conceptual artist. So the painting series by Onkawara called, um, the title is titled 1965, uh, made in 65 at the National Gallery of Art. The tripartite work comprises three deep pink canvases where the artist on Kawara meticulously painted three phrases, one thing, dash 1965, dash Vietnam in his signature style. Wulia recalled that she was upset by the boldness of the phrases. They seem to indicate that for Kawara, the, the year 1965 was marked by only one thing, namely the Vietnam War. Searching for the root of her intense reaction, to Kawara's work, Wulia reflected that her family history might have triggered such a response. She then decided to expand the one thing from Kawara's work, from Vietnam War to Indonesia's anti-communist massacres. So Wulia responded to Kawara's repatent work by recreating and adding multiple canvases that travel across the gallery's walls, ceilings, and floor to highlight the spatial and temporal disconnection between her family history, Indonesia's um, anti-communist killings, and global history. So as Indonesian artists begin to feel the weight of testimony and witnessing, some artists begin their investigation into testimonies materiality by investigating the use of archives, objects, and the agency of dead bodies. So Ranga Pubaya is a visual artist based in Yogyakarta. Uh, since 2015, he's used photography as his primary medium. And he created a series of works that explore his family history as well as the anti-communist um, killings of 65. His first series of work deals with family history. So his grandfather um, had also been um, uh, taken away in 65, disappeared and uh, must be presumed dead. So starting point, the image on the left here is the image of Luang Gubuk, a limestone cave with an opening of a vertical shaft 50 kilometers southeast of Jogja. 
The tourist attraction is famous for its natural beauty, but it is also alleged to be one of the killing fields um, during the um, 65 violence. Rubaya states that uh, it was at this time that his grandfather is rumored to have met his death. Um, starting point was then followed by other series of works titled Landscape of Deception, um, was made in 2018 where Pubaya explore landscapes as posthumous memorial for the 65 and 66 events. The landscape series becomes spaces of remembrance, in particular of places that already exist in the collective memory. Um, so mostly uh, Pubaya took pictures of um, 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 you know, mass, uh, mass killing sites, uh, often beautifully depicted in a salon photography style. Uh, so in investigating uh, Budiarjo, the image on your right, um, sees Pubaya assumed the role of an archivist. He meticulously collected his grandfather's extant documents from family members, so certificates, official documents, diaries, and photographs, and displayed them inside two glass vitrines. The artist retraced his grandfather's life through the artifacts to understand the person and the family history. So compared with other works, other works that focus on testimony, Purbaya does not rely on drama to convey his messages, but he still makes the same appeal for truth. The unearthing processes, displaying and manipulate, manipulating forensically acquired material, such as the objects and documents that once belonged to the missing presumed dead grandfather still elicit a strong response. Now, in comparison to Pubaya's trajectory from, from personal history to posthumous memorialization through artifacts and landscapes, Yaya Sung um, directly engaged with the critical historical document um, um, in her installation here. So this is um, a seven channel video installation titled The Future Lies, consists of uh, seven flat screen television screens on vertical frames. The screens were then arranged in a semi-circular formation facing away from the gallery entrance, positioned slightly apart from the screens, a large portfolio and a pair of white gloves sat on a table. The portfolio was the um, artist research journal that also contained copies of archival materials that the artist consulted for her work. So the main document that Sung refers is an article entitled, How Did the Generals Die? by the late Benedict Anderson. The article analyzed and translated into English the forensic report by the medical team that performed the autopsy on the bodies of six high-ranking Indonesian officers who were killed um, in the early hours of uh, 30th of September, 65. Um, Anderson's analysis highlights the fact that the bodies showed no signs of torture. Um, so Sung uh, notes in her work uh, that um, her works, uh, in fact, highlight uh, the autopsy report's findings, that is, the bodies of the officers were, in fact, intact. So the videos depict seven rotating naked male bodies accompanied by mournful music played on a loop. Working with a team of makeup artists, videographers, and talents, soon carefully and meticulously reconstructed the body's conditions based on the forensic report. So her team uh, vividly recreated bleeding gunshot wounds and bruises that had resulted from blunt trauma injuries. The bodies in Sung's video provide the viewer with an osteobiographical story of the violence inflicted upon them, thus giving the dead a sense of agency. Based on the artist's belief in the body's ability to convey a truthful account of events, namely the details about the circumstances and causes of the death, they are evidence of the lies of the new order regime. So Prubaya and Sung's work utilized a forensic imagination to create a space where third and fourth generation Indonesians can connect with one of the Indonesia's darkest periods of history, in their works, the forensic imagination creates a space to present evidence to stimulate discussions about the construction of truth during and after 65 in contemporary Indonesia. So to conclude, um, artistic representations of the anti-communist killings has been seen um, as an enabling space to help Indonesians remember and commemorate the events with varying degrees of reception. For artists such as Cristanto, Purbaya, and Wulia, um, whose family members were directly impacted by the violence, have inherited the mass killings memories in different ways, 
While their personal traumas lend a degree of authority and authenticity when speaking about the event's impact, they're nearly one generation apart, which perhaps explains their different approaches. For others outside the family circle, such as Zoom, um, they wish to comprehend the historical violence that haunts contemporary Indonesian society. So Earl's study on transcultural memory and its reception emphasized that receptions are never stable, once and for all understandings of collective memory. They will be shaped and reshaped across time by frameworks of discussive and otherwise mediated remembering, for example, uh, by social media and also of course by artworks. But are repeated particular representations of the past in the public arena and their assimilation into dominant discourses a sufficient indicator for the impact on collective memory in a society. Uh, so as some artists continuously strive to represent hard facts of history, um, so, but the representation of violence itself has been argued to form victimization. So as Indonesian artists and researchers are becoming more attuned to the impact of such representation, they shift away from literal representation of violence. The artworks uh, by Wulia and Kubaya, for example, still retain the testimonial framing of their content despite some artists, uh, despite their distinct uh, disillusionment with the approach. Also, the witnesses discussive role can be extended to the, into the materiality of the archive and non-human actors, such as we see um, in the works of Yayasum and Ranga Purbaya. So I shall leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ulan Dirgantoro for this wonderful presentation. And again, to Grace Luxana for hers. With that, um, we will conclude the recording and open um, the floor to questions. Mm -hmm.